Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Anand Thurgood-Bottom. We're going to talk today about what's changing in memory design. Anand, it used to be pretty simple when we thought about, okay, we're going to have this much DRAM in a design, we're going to have this much SRAM. What's changing? It's a very pertinent topic uh, because, you know, lots of things are changing in, uh, as it relates to memory design. So let's step back and look at what has been driving the explosive growth in memories for the last few years. I know there is economic tightening right now, so the, the memory market is going through a slump, but the last few years and what we also anticipate in the coming years is strong growth in memory. What is driving that is basically the rise of big data applications. And that can be automotive, autonomous driving, it can be cloud, AI, data center, so forth. So these different applications are, are impacting the way memory is being designed and it's impacting at the next level, the performance requirements, the power requirements, the density requirements, and unique requirements like reliability and long-term health and so forth. So they're having a significant impact on the way memory is being designed and developed. Now we used to think about memory in terms of, oh, we have this monolithic block of memory, this is what's available. Now we're getting much more granular and much more use case specific, right? That's correct, that's correct, exactly. And so no longer, is you know one size fits all that doesn't apply anymore off the shelf memories no longer the case all the memory manufacturers the idms are customizing their memories to cater to the different applications so we recognize this as a hyper customization trend let's take a closer look sure anand what are we looking at here sure just to illustrate the point what i've done is here is give you a sense for three different applications right you have auto pardon my cartoon here uh, that's automotive. This is supposed to be either mobile client devices. This is cloud AI, of course, in the, sense, in the context of cloud, like training, for example, or even inference in the cloud. The reason I have these three is just to illustrate the point that these are three different applications, and the memories that are required are, are quite different in terms of the application needs. So really, what you have here is many different types of memories to cater to these different application segments. So at the next level, what this means is that memory IDMs, they pursue relentlessly the PPA scaling. That is the technology scaling that kind of is the underpinning for it, right? Because they need to have higher performance, lower power, more dense. But they actually have to also take care of application-specific requirements. For example, you could have application-specific power requirements, performance requirements. But beyond that, there are some unique requirements, like in the case of automotive, you need more reliability right, uh, longer term reliability, and so forth. So all of this now has to be repeated for the end applications. What I mean by that is they have to customize these memories with PPA in mind, with application specific requirements in mind for the different end segments. Part of what's happening here is that computing is now in everything and AI is actually coming into everything too. So you have even more data that has to be stored what kinds of choices are you making here? What do you actually have to think about when you're designing this? Yeah, so, I mean, at the highest level, it, it is dictated by the applications. So automotive memories, for example, uh, depending on, on what the application is, they require longer reliability, which is, you know, for example, a 15-year lifetime. In the case of cloud uh, AI, for example, training, higher bandwidth, that's a requirement. Data center, power is not as much of a concern. But then now there, are, there is also the increased need for uh, higher performance, but at a certain power. The performance per watt is becoming a, an important paradigm. So it all depends. And these different application segments are driving how the memories are being designed for these different segments, right? And what's happening is that this, I think I want to reinforce this point here, that as the memory uh, IDMs do the design and development, they actually have to make sure that they have the processes in place to be able to reduce the overall turnaround time because otherwise they'll never be able to meet the time to market goals. So the development turnaround time, as we call it in the technical parlance, is very, very important. And that is basically going to translate to a next level or what I call as the ground level requirements, which we can talk about also. There's something here called the design gap between uh, what's being designed and, and how that actually appears in memory, how do you get there? I mean, what, how do you close that up is really the challenge, right? That's correct, that's correct, exactly. So if you really look here, uh, what I've done is I've created this four quadrant view, uh, just to illustrate the point. At the ground level, when it comes to memory design, 
Um, these are the key requirements. So memory designers and technologists are looking to minimize the technology to design gap. And what that means is that for the bleeding edge memories, which are on very advanced technology nodes, right? These are actually called the FinFET class technology nodes. They are facing the same challenges. So uh, there's increased variation. The, they have to actually be able to come up with novel structures in order to cater to the requirements. So the technology development has become a lot more complex, which means there's a higher probability of, the, of, of failures as you go from technology to design. So they would like to assess the impact of the technology choices early on. Choice impact as in design PPA. So, so that the gap between what they intended from a technology point of view and what they get in terms of the design itself is minimized. So this is basically a loop. And what designers and technologists want is the ability to be able to minimize this gap by what we call as co-optimizing. So technologists, memory technologists, and designers want to be able to, as they develop the technology, quickly assess what is the impact of that technology choice on the design and optimize. So that is the co-optimization. So this term is actually called DTCO, Design Technology Co-Optimization. This is an emerging paradigm, and many of the memory makers are actually focused on this aspect. And we think about what's happened in logic. This has been going on for, what, several different nodes but we always thought that memory was on its own track. Now they're running into exactly the same problems the logic guys did, right? That's correct, that is correct. In fact, logic, the concept of DTCO is actually pretty established, design technology optimization. Now this is actually important for memory as well for the same reasons. Because the technologies are so complex, the, the technologists and the designers want to be able to have an early insights into the, the decisions they're making on the technology side. How will it impact design PPA? So this is a very, very important area in memory technology development as well. And there's another level for this too, which is system technology co-optimization, where you're actually pulling in the logic and the memory, right? That is correct. So STCO, which you're referring to, is another important, especially in the context of 3D memories. How do you put together uh, you know, the different the stack memories as well, as well as, to your point, logic and memory together in new emerging memory architectures. Do the tools that you've, you've developed on the logic side apply in the memory side, or do they have to be completely recreated? That's a very good point. Actually, you're, you're, that's a nice segue to this particular topic here. So memory designers want to be able to close the design faster in order to meet the overall turnaround time goals. So what, uh, what is happening now is many of the memory designers are looking to leverage digital techniques, digital tools, digital methodologies, and apply that to what is traditionally a custom design flow. Memory is typically a custom design flow, but uh, what they're realizing now is that there are opportunities to be able to bring in the digital tools and methodologies to extract some efficiencies, you know, close the design faster. So this is actually what is known as uh, digitization. So this trend is again emerging, and many of the memory makers are actually embracing this approach. Basically what you're dealing with here then is you're moving memory into the same kind of shift left approach and even concurrent approach that you have in logic, right? That is absolutely right. So in fact, this digitization concept here is part of the larger paradigm or theme, which is shift left. Shift left actually applies here as well. So here, um, digitization actually is the sub theme of shift left, the broader shift left theme, which is Memory designers are now looking to be able to do things faster, sooner, earlier, conceptually, right? That actually helps them to address the overall turnaround time challenge. So they're looking for faster simulation. They're looking for more automated way of retargeting, which is an important theme as well. Because if you want to cater to different applications, you want to be able to customize. You want to be able to retarget, retrofit for the different end applications. So that, that's something that's actually emerging again. And they also want to be able to get early awareness into the uh, impact of parasitics on the design in terms of reliability on the design and so forth. So that is the early awareness piece. So physically aware design is another important area and reliability aware design. So these are very important requirements in the concept of, uh, in the context of shift left, reliability aware, physically aware. This helps them to you know, move things, shift, literally shift left as in do things earlier. Are you finding some companies, uh, some of the big IDMs are also now doing all this together and saying, okay, we need to simulate all of this. We need to simulate the whole system. 
Yes, actually, that is true. In fact, um, IDMs want to go as high and as big as they can when it comes to being able to simulate. So now, the concept of simulating an entire array plus the power delivery network, as they call it, which is basically the power and the ground together. So this is becoming an important requirement now. Previously, the entire industry used to view this as an unsolvable problem because of the capacity needs and the simulation runtime needs. Think of a, a large memory array with parasitics, with the entire power delivery network. We are talking about millions and millions of elements in the design. Now it's becoming a requirement because, again, the need to be able to make sure that your designs are robust and reliable and resilient means that you have to be able to simulate with the power delivery network to capture the effects of the power delivery network. And this becomes uh, one of the critical requirements now. So we're still doing divide and conquer, but we're now reassembling in unique ways depending upon what they're trying to do. That's correct, and dictated by the requirements. In certain cases, this becomes an absolute must, especially if you're talking about being able to optimize the power, being able to optimize the margins. You want to be able to capture accurately the voltage drops, and that can only happen if you have the PDN in the simulation. And so that's, again, dictated by the requirements, yes. So you're dealing with things like how thick are the wires, what's the distance between the, the different memories and memory and logic. All that has to be taken into account. That's correct, yeah. So again, the scope is getting larger and bigger and broader. Even within memory now, you now have 3D memory. So you've got certainly 3D NAND, which is now up at, what, 256 layers or some, something like that. Yeah. You also have uh, 3D DRAM coming in. What's the impact of that? Are we dealing with the same kinds of problems as we are in heterogeneous 3D packages? Yeah, so you know, 3D memories, I think, is, is emerging. It's actually here. It is actually creating the same types of challenges that you would see with 3D structures, multi-die structures. So reliability becomes a very important area to focus on when it comes to 3D memories, simply because, not just because an application segment demands it, but also simply because of the way the, the 3D stack is. So now memory designers have to worry about or focus on reliability as in the electrical stress, the thermal stress, as they go through or traverse the 3D stack, and even the mechanical stress. So electromechanical, electrothermal, these are all new stress factors which are now playing a role, and memory designers have to worry about that and also make sure that the designs are resilient enough to be able to deal with those stresses. And we're dealing with now mission-critical and safety-critical types of designs, too. You think about a a car, nobody ever really thought about memory in a car really in the past. You think about medical devices, same thing, and even data centers where they have to, they've been working with memory for a long time, but now it has to be much faster than what it was, and you have a lot more data, right? That's correct. A lot faster and also more reliable, more resilient. And going back to your point, this, I think, is what we see as the design to silicon gap. Whatever you've in, you intended in terms of design doesn't actually necessarily materialize in silicon. So these are what we call as defect escapes, how do you minimize the defect escapes? How do you minimize the gap between uh, design intent and actual silicon? So this is a focus of the memory designers now, and this falls under the, in the reliability category. And here is where the thermal stress, you know, the thickness of the wires, the ability of the wires to carry current, that's one, one aspect of the failure. Other is basically just gross manufacturing defects. Uh, another aspect is over the right lifetime of the memories, because of the stresses, the device characteristics themselves change. How your design needs to be resilient enough to be able to deal with the, uh, the stresses during the lifetime of the product, the normal lifetime. And then for automotive, it's much longer lifetime, 3X, 4X, depending on the case. And so you need to be able to have long-term reliability. And what is also emerging is health. What that means is that memory IDMs, memory design manufacturers now also need a way to be able to monitor the health of their devices in field. And they need mechanisms to be able to optimize and correct for performance in field. So this is where the, the full life cycle management aspect, as we call it, uh, becomes important even for memories. How much of what is being learned on the memory side is going now back into the logic side? Because you think about things like resilience Memory really led the world in that, right, with ECC memory. That's correct. How much of that, and, and now we're starting to see monitors coming in, so you have the telematics coming in to say what's going on inside the chip. 
that will now go into memory as, and they'll all be in, in a single system. How much of what you're learning in one is flowing across to the other? Is it only one direction or is it now two directions? No, it's cross-pollination. So, because I mean, many, in many cases, if you look at the higher level, they coexist. Uh, memories do have a significant amount of logic. Uh, you have the controllers, for example, if we, get, if we talk about DRAM memories. But not just that, if you talk about an SOC, you have memories, you have all the logic and so forth. So the telematics and the, the monitoring aspect actually applies both to memories as well as the logic in the context of an SOC. Memory led the way in certain areas, that of course bleeds into the other side, and if logic led the way in certain areas, like DTC, for example, it bleeds onto this side. So looking forward, what does memory actually look like five years from now? What changes? Um, there are different threads that these uh, leading memory vendors are pursuing. Um, one is, of course, 3D. Um, that's, I think, of course, going to be there for the next few years. The other thread that I've seen them pursue is moving the compute closer to the memory. So that's the reason why you, know, you have the in-memory compute, compute in memory, as some of them call it. So moving the compute closer, specialized compute functions moving closer to the memory, that's another trend. So you'll have different memory architectures emerge to support that. And then at the protocol level, of course, with CXL now starting to come into play, you will have a lot of applications built around um, you know, CXL as well. So there's a lot of development going on just around moving that data, right? You want to reduce the resistance, you want to reduce the capacitance, and you want to reduce the, the distance that the data has to travel. That's correct. I mean, the shorter the distance that the data travels, the better it is from a performance point of view. And that is what is motivating the compute in memory or near memory, at memory, in memory compute type uh, applications because for certain specialized functions, you're better served by keeping the compute close or in memory. As well as some really advanced physical layer type of development in the FIs? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the physical layer is actually where the data transport actually happens. And therefore, as you see, for example, when we say PPA scaling, it's actually performance scaling. It's also refers to higher, faster data rates, for example. Right, faster data rates actually means you have more advanced files that are able to support faster data transport. Anand Thurogan Bottom, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks for the opportunity, Ed. It was great talking to you.